we need to learn to, to, to roll with things. You know, uh, there's always a lesson to be learned in everything that happens, right? And, you know, the day is going to come when we're not going to have electricity if we want to worship the Lord. And I, I'm not saying that tongue-in-cheek. I'm not, that's not like a, there's no spiritual kind of symbolism to that. I, if, if we believe the Bible, if we believe uh, the prophecies, the comforts and the conveniences, the freedoms uh, that we enjoy now will not last until uh, the day the Lord comes. Do you believe that? Um, we don't know exactly what that time is going to look like, but we've seen, uh, we've seen the evidence historically of times when the church, if you wanted to worship according to your conscience, if you wanted to worship uh, with like believers, you had to go to extreme measures. Um, I'll probably, uh, this is off the cuff, Sandy. I, I hope uh, this wasn't planned, so I don't know where this is going. But it reminds me just a little bit of my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Europe a few years ago during the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and we got to go to some of the key Reformation sites. And one of the big things that we, uh, uh, we value in, in history as those who have uh, been leaders in standing up for their faith is the Waldensians in, in northern Italy. And we got to go to a Waldensian uh, church, and we got to go to a place uh, where the Waldensians had to flee uh, during times of persecution. And we went to a cave, and we went into this dark cave. You had to walk up a trail, and we were part of a group. And so there was about, I don't know, 30, 40 of us uh, that went into the cave. Do you remember this, Gina? And uh, it felt tight in that cave with the 30 or 40 that were there. I mean, it felt kind of arm to arm in this cave. And it was a cave you kind of had to crawl through, and then there was a small opening at the top where a little light came through. And our guide that was there said, Um, during the heights of persecution, over a hundred would go into that cave. And I'm like elbow to elbow with, you know, and it's dark, so you're really getting to know people (laughs) in the dark in this cave. And they would cram into that cave to either flee because uh, because the government was, uh, was trying to destroy them, or if they wanted to simply worship. They had to go into that cave uh, to try to find privacy and worship. And we sang a song in that cave. We sang a hymn. Everyone had their uh, lights on, you know, <laughs> uh, with their flashlights or, or their phones, you know. And it was a powerful moment just realizing, now, that's extreme, right? I mean, those, those, you can't go everywhere and, and learn those stories, but those things do happen. To what extent believers in the past have gone to, to say, I will stand up for my faith. I will worship the Lord as my faith tells me. I will go to whatever lengths necessary to maintain the, the worship and, and the, the relationship and the, uh, the truth that I understand of God. So, you know, we use these little things as reminders of that. You know, the Hebrew people, one of their festivals that they had every year was called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And for, I think it was about a week, um, they would have to build a temporary shelter um, you know, outside of their homes, outside of the synagogue, and that is where they would live and they would worship as a memory of uh, what their ancestors had done coming out of, it, out of Egypt when they wandered in the wilderness. But I, the thought came to me too, um, not only is that a nice reminder, but it's also kind of a good preparation, isn't it? You know, that one day you may not be able to just go into your comfort zones and, and things, but you might, you might figure out what it's like to, to worship in, in a setting of, uh, quite different than the conveniences and, and arrangements that the, uh, the physical uh, church is able to provide. Uh, one day we may not have those. And how much longer until that day comes? Will 2023 be an average year, and, or will we see prophecy and further, further challenges? Well, uh, we know uh, the Lord has a plan. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, that we can be here. Thank you that we can learn lessons and we can, we can overcome obstacles, Lord, and we can rally together even when uh, some of the expectations of, of uh, 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 the electronics or whatever are not functioning like we'd like. But thank you that we're able to come and uh, be here. Thank you that things are, are moving forward and going well right now. I thank you for the contribution of uh, all of our, our people that are dedicated to our worship here, Lord. Thank you for the music, uh, and thank you that your spirit is here with us. Bless this time as we think and we worship and we 
listen to your word together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um, there is one more thing I wanted, wanted to say, and I, I don't like embarrassing people. You know me. I never would embarrass anyone. But Robin, how long have you been coming to this church? Six months. Six months. <laughs> Did you know what you were getting into when you said, hey, I'll help with audiovisual? I've got, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say thank you because Robin has, he's a new member of our church. He's dove in. And uh, I know that uh, George Herber used to be there all the time, and he's being a relief, and Nassim is trying to help, and there's others that are trying to be helpful. But Robin, thank you. Thank you for being a servant. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a very emotional word. You either feel it or you don't, really. I mean, if you're of the, if you're of the uh, uh, you know, growing up in the church, if you've been, uh, uh, if you're aware of kind of what we mean when we say hallelujah, it's a very emotional word. You can say it without feeling it or not, but, but really it's, it's, it's more of an expression uh, than it is just simply a phrase or a word. Hallelujah. It, uh, it's an interesting thing uh, in the Bible of how it's used, and I want to talk about hallelujah today. So be, as I do that, I do want to invite the young people to help out with the kids' quiz. Can we go black and yellow? Are those ones good? What's that? Oh, well, we're not going to talk about that, Eva. So, Jaden and Toby, go ahead and raise your hands. I'd love to have your help, um, any of the young people, except you that are cheating back in the booth. You are banned. You're not cheating? Oh, my goodness. I think I see over here. Delia, is that Delia? Delia. All right, Delia. What does the word hallelujah mean? E. Praise the Lord. Oh, she got that right out of the bat. Praise the Lord. That's really, it's a translation uh, of, of these three Hebrew words or the way they're put. Hallel, meaning praise or uh, being of joy. You, which is you, Yah is the shortened of the Lord. So praise you, the Lord, and, you know, if you're to follow it that way, but just praise the Lord is what hallelujah means. And you can say praise the Lord, and it means hallelujah, or you can say hallelujah, and it means praise the Lord. It goes both ways. Another way to say hallelujah is said or expressed today is, holy Lou said, yeah, hall of low you, hello you stud, or hallelujah. Which one is it? How else do we say all right, I see some... Oh, in the back, is that you, Sean? All right, Sean, go ahead. D. Okay. All right, I know I was being a little silly on that one. But, you know, I grew up... You know, and a lot of times when we sing hallelujah, it's sung alleluia. And when I was growing up, I didn't realize it was the same word. I thought alleluia was, oh, that's super holy, whatever it is. It's, man, that's really deep stuff. Alleluia. It's all everybody doing you, yeah, whatever that means. Um, it's the same thing. It's just, it's just as, it, as the word went through the Greek, and then it went through the Latin, and then it went through the English and everything else, it, it just got shortened, and it kind of got abbreviated, and it is the same word when you say alleluia versus hallelujah. Hallelujah is, is technically, in, in uh, rhetoric, is called an interjection. It's a spontaneous expression, excuse me, most often associated in the Bible with what? Do we see hallelujah mostly with sermons? I guess not, because I didn't get a hallelujah right there. Is it in music and songs? Is it common in prayer or in the poetry section, the wisdom, you know, Proverbs and stuff? Or is it mostly miracles? Where do we see hallelujah mostly in the Bible? All right, I see Andre up here. You guys are making me nervous. Let's give Andre a chance, and then I'll come to you, Dylan. Songs. All right, Andre says songs. Dylan, what do you say? And Eric, you too. Um, miracles. You did that on purpose. <laughs> okay. All right. These guys are helping, and sometimes they look ahead, and, you know, you got to be careful. But Andre and Dylan, you're right. It's mostly in songs. 
It is actually part of a musical uh, an attribute to songs, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more. So, where does hallelujah or praise the Lord appear mostly in the Bible? Is it in the Chronicles? Is it among the two major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah? Do we find it mostly in Psalms? Is it all over the place in Acts, or what about Revelation? Where do we find it? Is that great? Or is it Delia again? Sorry. All right, Delia. C. She says Psalms. I'll let one or two other answer if they would like. All right, Eric. B. Oh, now he says Isaiah, Jeremiah. And was there another one over here? Where? Jump up and down. I can't see. Oh, there you are. Isaiah. C. C. All right. You guys know it. I kind of kind of teased it a little bit with, uh, with mentioning that it's mostly found in songs because psalms are songs. It's not as much as you might think. Uh, the word hallelujah is not as common in the Bible. When I was, you know, really just getting into this, you know, I thought it was a lot more common. It's not. I mean, the sentiment and similar phrases are, are a little bit more common, but the actual formulated term, hallelujah, only 24 times. And just as an example, I want to show you, this is the entire Psalm 117, which I think is the shortest psalm. It's used twice. Um, there's actually a section of psalms called the hallelujah psalms. Um, and so here you see it translated as, praise the Lord, all nations, laud Him, all peoples, for His loving kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting praise the Lord. This is one of them where it's twice, and I want you to notice it's at the beginning and at the end. In every use of the word in the Psalms, with one exception, it is always at the beginning or the end. Always at the beginning or the end, with one exception in Psalm 113. So, it kind of is a, uh, a meter used often in songs as an, an introduction or as a conclusion to a thought. I do have one more question, Jaden and Toby, in case you were uh, wondering if the quiz was over. Hallelujah only appears in one place in the New Testament. Did you know that? Only one place. Which place do you think it is found? And I'll give you a hint. Which book is about endings? <laughs> Revelation. Oh. What's your name? Benjamin. Benjamin. Thank you for helping out, Benjamin. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't catch that at first. Thank you, Benjamin. That's right. It is in Revelation. Jade and Toby, thank you guys for helping out. Thank you, kids, for interacting a little bit here with the beginning of the message. Not only is it only in Revelation, but it is found four times in Revelation 19, and it is often called the fourfold or the four hallelujahs, right there in Revelation 19. And that's what I want to talk with you about. As I was thinking about the time of year, this being the last Sabbath of 2022, and thinking about, you know, what things might uh, be of benefit for us to take time meditating on, I thought, well, I should at least go to the last book of the Bible. We should talk about things that come at the end, since we're at the end of the year. And that's kind of how uh, the thought germinated for the message today, and looking at the hallelujahs of Revelation 19. Are you ready? The four hallelujahs. Just briefly, we're going to talk about what they are, when they take place, and what their purpose is. Why are they there? Again, hallelujah, you know, you, you kind of, it, depending on the tradition you come up with, you might hear that word a lot in church. And you might come to think, man, it must have been on the lips of people and just every time Paul wrote and spoke and taught and everything, hallelujah, up and down, this and that. It's not as common. And that, that, again, I just think is interesting that only here in Revelation, only in Revelation, in the New Testament at least, is the musical insertion of hallelujah expressed. And those things stand out to me. They make me wonder why. So let's look at Revelation. You're, you're welcome to open your Bibles there with me, or I'll just put these six verses on the screen and you can follow along as I go. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but not a lot for the message today. Revelation 19 and verse 1. We'll get into kind of where this is happening. If you're not a big… By the way, I'm not a Revelation scholar. This is not like my strength as a Bible student. Other people are really excellent at, at Revelation and other prophecies. I'm comfortable with it, but there are some people that excel in it. Um, I'm coming at this uh, just a little bit more as a, uh, a novice Bible student, you might say. But 
I've done my best to put these thoughts together. So, Revelation 19.1, after these things, and we'll get to what those things are in just a minute, but the chapter begins, after these things, and we're getting toward the end, right? Revelation 19, there's only 22 chapters in Revelation, so we're getting to the end here. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. I just want to point out some things along the way here. The voices are coming from heaven, and John describes it as best as he had access to in the time of a great multitude. Now, in the Greek world, in the world of which John grew up, any major city would have an amphitheater. And the most uh, uh, loud or the greatest crowd experience, if you were in that world, would be go to the local amphitheater, unless you were in Rome or one of these big cities that had coliseums and hippodromes and whatnot. But for the average person who never went more than 50 miles from their home in the ancient world, 99% of people in the ancient world never went fit more than 50 miles from their home, um, you would go to the amphitheater, and that was the only place where you would be able to experience the reality of what maybe 5,000 or 10,000 voices shouting out at once might sound like. I've been to some of those amphitheaters in Turkey and other places. After these things, I heard a loud voice like the great, like, uh, of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, there's the first one. It's never been said in the New Testament until now, never been recorded But here it is in Revelation 19, saying, hallelujah. And any Jewish reader, anyone who was familiar with the Old Testament would immediately go back to the Psalms and say, okay, we're now in a musical kind of an environment here. We're opening up a new chain of thought here. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Now, there's something interesting about this that you won't notice unless you, you get into it. Before the word salvation, glory, and power, some of your Bibles may have honor there as well. Uh, some ancient manuscripts have honor, some don't, so some Bibles have it, some don't. But before the words salvation, glory, and power, the definite article, the, is there. I have not found an English translation that includes the the. The the, the I'm sorry that that sounds funny to say it. It's not common in Greek for these words to have the in front of it. It was an extra thing that was not natural. Most of the time when you hear expressions like this in the New Testament, and there are expressions like this of the doxology of the the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, that's kind of similar to that. There's no the in those. The kingdom, the power. Yes, there is. Excuse me. Let's reverse that. So there are places where it is, but it is interesting, and scholars have pointed out that the presence of the definite article is, is an indicator that this expression of hallelujah, the salvation, the glory, and I'll, I'll just put the, 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 the there, excuse me, um, is somewhat of an indicator of a finality or an, uh, an elevation of the expression of salvation and glory and power. The way I've kind of thought of it is like this. Um, you know, sometimes when you're commenting on something, you'll say, man, they're the man, right? And you emphasize the, or man, that was the best, Right? If you're from Ohio State, any of you that follow college sports, if you, you know, if you're from a different college, you say, I'm from UCLA, or I go to the U, or I'm from UW, or, you know, any of these things. But if you're from Ohio State, isn't it Ohio State that says the Ohio State, right? They emphasize the, the, as a way of saying there's really no other college out there. There's only the Ohio State, um, I'm still new in this conference, and I still get to meet pastors from time to time. And every now and then, as I'm, whether it's at camp meeting or a pastor, they'll say, oh, uh, what, what, what church do you pastor? I like to say, I pastor the Scottsdale Thunderbird. <laughs> and everyone kind of understands that you're emphasizing, you're trying to set it apart. It's not just any church, it's not just anything, it's not just any college or any person. It's the. And I think, now remember, John is not just inspired with thoughts to write this, he's writing down what he hears. He heard a great multitude in heaven say the salvation, the glory, and the power belong to our God, right? That's what he heard and that's what he wrote. And so it's just interesting that there's an emphasis. There's been lots of expressions of salvation and glory and power, but this is the hallelujah the salvation, the glory, and the power belong to our God. 
He goes on to say, uh, uh, recording what he hears, because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has, notice the past tense, the Lord has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth and her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So these are continuing expressions of, 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 of joy. And a second time they said, the same voices from heaven, the second time they said, hallelujah, right? This is now the second time. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Now, we just need to acknowledge what what is being talked about here. We remember as as people who are uh, uh, familiar with Scripture that most of Revelation is based on Old Testament images, metaphors, and wording. And when he uses this phrase, or when he hears this phrase, her smoke rises up forever and ever, it is a direct quote from Isaiah 34, when when Isaiah describes the collapse of literal Babylon, he uses this same phrase, that when Babylon is finally destroyed, uh, you know, it's not going to come back again, her smoke will rise up forever and ever. So the Bible uses that exact same phrase speaking about spiritual Babylon, just as literal Babylon will be destroyed forever and ever, so will spiritual Babylon uh, not rise up forever and ever. Now, there's a, a bit of a misnomer about what this means. In, in, in our modern parlance today, we, we even use the phrase, where there's smoke, there's fire. You've heard that before, right? And so people that are advocates and believers in eternal burning and eternal hell say, well, if the smoke is going up forever and ever, then obviously the fire has got to be burning forever and ever because you can't have smoke without fire. But that's kind of a modern way of looking at it. In the ancient world, when they saw the smoke go up, the smoke would go up and it never came down. It just kind of went up into the atmosphere and it went up forever and it would never come down as just simply an indicator that what has been destroyed will never come back again. So in the, in the Jewish youth, and even when Isaiah uses it in Isaiah 34, right after he says her smoke rises up forever, he, the very next thing he says, but the desert will blossom and the animals will come back and dwell in it and, and God will make this place a refuge for his people. So obviously it wasn't burning because of the, next, the very next thing is it's going to be a place of great joy and dwelling, uh, which is similar to what will happen here at the destruction of the spiritual Babylon. So her smoke rising up forever just means the finality and the reality that Babylon will never rise again. That oppressing power, that liar, that deceiver, that persecutor, that rejecter of all things that are true and and noble and good will be gone forever. And the 24 elders, just going to move along here, um, or else I might start preaching if I don't get moving here. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to get into the identity of the 24 elders and the four living creatures. I think it's a fascinating study. I think it's a worthy study. There's not really a grand consensus on their identity. What is, I think, important to recognize is this is kind of like the innermost counsel of God. Whether these 24 elders, whoever they are, what these four living creatures are, whatever they represent, they clearly are identified in the Bible as the most innermost uh, uh, leadership, kind of the cabinet of God or the innermost council. They too fall down in acknowledging what's happening and they say the third hallelujah, hallelujah. And they say, amen, so be it, let it be, it is well, whatever amen, it means several things. Amen, hallelujah. Now it's interesting the number, something happening three times in the Bible is very significant. The holy, 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 or, um, you know, the Trinity is three. Three is obviously kind of a symbol of God and of, of completeness and wholeness. And you would think that three hallelujahs would be enough. But the Lord goes on and the, 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 the vision and revelation goes on to introduce a fourth. And this is very significant. It's kind of been building to this. A voice came from the throne, from the throne. Now, that can mean from the one seated on the throne, so it's God speaking, but it's not typical for God to say, and God said, give praise to your God. He, he, it, definitely, the Bible can include that, but it's almost like the throne itself is personified, like the throne itself is speaking, which, by the way, would not be unusual for Revelation because in Revelation chapter 9, the altar speaks. So we know that a lot of things in vision are happening here, and we're not really looking at a, a literal thing, but it's as though the throne itself that seat of authority is speaking. And in the, in the circumstance of what's happening, the throne itself says, give praise to our God, 
all you His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. Most people that study this and, and that I have looked at suggest that this invitation is a universal call by the throne of God or by, uh, you know, by the Lord Himself, however you want to uh, interpret the throne, to all of God's creation, not just in this world, but in every world and to angels as well. This is a universal… Remember, the great controversy that, that I've talked about at length uh, in this church, and, and, and we need to be reminded of as Seventh-day Adventists, involves more than just us. The angels are bound up in it. Every intelligent creation, the entire universe of God is bound up in the issue of sin. When Satan rebelled against God, it didn't just affect us here on planet Earth and then when Adam and Eve, it affected God's entire family. So this is an invitation to all people, great, small, everyone who fears Him, every bondservant to give praise to our God, which is another kind of form of hallelujah. Then John says, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, but he says, I need to, I need to explain even further because I've already talked about the voice. It's more than that. It's like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. John uses every device that he has access to to say the next thing I heard was beyond anything that I can describe. It was like thunder. It was like waters. It was like a multitude. And again, it gives the idea that that invitation has now gone out to the entire created universe of God, and they're all now saying together the fourth and final, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And that's, that's those four hallelujahs. Each of them is significant. Each of them is interesting. We can look at them and we can appreciate the different elements of what's being said here. But as I was working on this message and I was thinking, of, hey, what, is, what is going on here? Why is this important at this juncture? So let's look at where these hallelujahs are taking in prophetic history. So right before Revelation 19, you have Revelation 18, obviously, and it concludes with the downfall of Babylon. Rejoice over her, O heavens, and you saints, apostles, prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her, her being Babylon, the spiritual Babylon of Revelation. So by the end of chapter 18, Babylon is over. Babylon is defeated, okay? The, the great controversy has concluded, but the Lord hasn't come yet because Revelation 19, 7, after the four hallelujahs, is the description of the marriage of the Lamb and the coming of the Lord on the great white steed charger, the white horse. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is now after the hallelujahs. Let us rejoice and be glad, give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, he who sits on it is called faithful and true. So, the hallelujahs are in between the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. Christ has not come yet. It's just interesting. Babylon has fallen. The you know, prophetic end has come. Jesus is at the threshold, but He's not here yet. You with me? He's not here yet. And then you have these four hallelujahs spread across the entire universe being said. In a way, it's kind of like, a, a, forgive me for using too many metaphors here today, another sports metaphor. It's kind of like the, home, the, the winning home run has been hit. Okay, it's, it's been hit. It's gone over the fence. And everyone is cheering, but he, the, the, the home run hitter has not stepped on home plate yet. Now, technically, you sports fans know this. Until he steps on home plate, the game isn't over. And historically, did you know, even in the World Series, there have been game-winning hits where the base runner failed to complete the play and the fielders recognized it and got the runner out even after everyone. In, in one game in, in New York, in, 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 uh, when the Yankees, I don't remember the year, the crowd rushed onto the field. There was a runner, this wasn't a home run, 
but um, a base winning hit had been made, but the runner on first failed to run all the way to second. The crowd rushes onto the field. Everyone's cheering. Our team won. Our team won. The second baseman realized, hey, the guy on first didn't get to second. He pushes through the crowd, literally, it's a true story, finds the ball, runs over to second base and starts jumping up and down on it, trying to show the ump. He's out. He's out. He's out. The umpire said, you're right. The play was never completed. He's out. The game is over. And everyone on the field had to just realize their team didn't win. So just again, an analogy here, but this is kind of like what it is. The home run has been hit. Everyone's cheering, but the game isn't quite over yet because he's still rounding the base. It's just a way of looking at it. Babylon has fallen, and the Lord is coming, but He's not here yet, but yet the celebration is beginning, and that's not wrong. It's not wrong, but that's kind of the context that I saw here. The four hallelujahs are the realization before the completion. I think it would be kind of odd if, you know, your favorite team was to, you know, hit that home run and you say, wait, 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 wait a minute, guys. Let's just make sure he doesn't trip and break his leg while he's rounding the bases. Let's just make sure he gets… I think most people would say the, the, the conclusion is so clear that the celebration is appropriate, even though it's not quite here yet. I want to give you just another uh, analogy of why this is important as, as I was studying it. What does this matter? Why do we need to know about this experience? Why is this included in this juncture in, in Revelation? Why do we need to be told these, these beautiful expressions, these spontaneous expressions of praise the Lord, hallelujah? And the, anal- the analogy that came to my mind comes from pop culture. And I don't often use this, okay, guys? I don't like to usually use uh, entertainment and pop culture, but um, it's New Year's Eve, and we're just going to do it today. <laughs> I, I actually think this is a great movie. If you've not seen it, I, I think it's a great movie. It came out in 2016, and, and if you've not seen it, 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 it gives a uh, uh, it's the story of how three African-American women contributed in a significant way to the early NASA program, okay? And it chronicles their story. It's very well done. I, I think it's an excellent, excellent movie. Um, and it, it celebrates, you know, some of the early successes and challenges and, and how they had to overcome things. But at, at one juncture in the movie, and in a way, it's kind of the, it might even be considered the the whole crucial moment in the movie. I guess that's debatable depending on, on how you look at it. But one of the characters played by um, uh, that guy, Kevin Costner, um, who's, who's a fictional character but kind of based on a real guy, uh, he's the director of a special task force of NASA. And they're having all kinds of problems. Any of you grow up in the 60s? No one's going to read. No one wants to admit it. I can see. All right. You know, the space race was huge. The, the, the whole challenge with the Russians being ahead of us, and if, you, if you're not a student of history or if you, you weren't there at the time, it's, it's hard to understand what it was really like. It wasn't just that there was another country beating us in, in science and exploration and technology. It was the ideology of communism was winning. The ideology of communism was winning. And in America, we just thought that was impossible. And, and I, I don't want to get into all the geopolitical elements of it, but it was a big deal the Russians were winning, and whoever controls the, sp- the space, the thought was, controls the world. So it was a big deal that the Americans, you know, catch up with the Russians and tells the story of how these different characters are competing. But in this mo- particular moment, bear with me as, as I'm getting to the point here, um, he's having kind of a, a transparent moment with Catherine. That's, her name's Catherine Johnson. It's hard to see. It's really um, faded out. I apologize about that. Can you see her okay? Um, He's talking with her, and he's standing in front of this chalkboard with all these mathematical equations, and he's just saying, look, this is a problem. We haven't learned the math yet. We don't know the engineering. We don't know how the Russians are beating us, um, and and we have major problems ahead of us. And if we don't solve these problems, if we don't figure out the math, if we don't figure out the engineering, we're not going to the moon. We're not going anywhere. And we've got these major, and he kind of just goes into the problems, and he's, he's, trying to, he's showing his frustration, and he's looking at all these problems on the board. But then he makes this statement. He says, if we don't solve these problems, we're not going anywhere. But then he looks at Catherine, and he says, but in my mind, I'm already there. 
in my mind, I'm already there. And then he asks her, are you there too? Are you there? And it's just this way of, of expressing an idea that I know that there are problems, I know that there are challenges, and I don't even know the answers to those challenges, but I am already beyond them. My mind is already at the solution. I'm already on the moon. I don't have it figured out here on earth yet, but in my mind, I'm already there. And that's what I think the four hallelujahs are there for. You know, the, the way in which the world is progressing, it doesn't look like we're going to get there. When I look at the problems on the chalkboard, it doesn't look like faith is working. It doesn't look like Christianity is progressing. It doesn't look like the church is winning. It doesn't look like we're going to get there. But hallelujah, I'm already there. You know, it took almost 500 years for Europe to go from being a Christian place to being a post-Christian place. But in less than a generation, America has gone from being a Christian nation to being a post-Christian nation, and I think we could very easily argue that she's becoming very anti-Christian. And the problems look troublesome. How are we going to get there? How is the Lord going to do it? I can't answer it all. I don't know all the math yet. I don't understand every prophecy just perfectly, but one thing I do know is, hallelujah, I'm already there. The Lord has an answer. The Lord has a solution. Hallelujah. The salvation, the glory, and the power don't belong to Dave Lounsbury. They don't belong to me. They belong to the Lord. I'm already there. Hallelujah. The smoke of, of, of is going to rise up forever. She'll never rise up again. That power that lies and persecutes, that twists, that oppresses it's going to be destroyed forever. Hallelujah. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm already there. Hallelujah and amen. So be it. Let it be. The 24 elders, the four living creatures, before it's even happened, they cry out, hallelujah. He hasn't finished going around the bases yet, but the home run hit will go across that and the game will be over. And the Lord will come. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Hallelujah. I don't know what 2023 is going to do to us. Maybe another pandemic. Probably some kind of politics. <laughs> Who knows what the environment's going to be? Maybe the power will get shut off. The other thought I had, um, where are you, Eva? When you talked about, you can pull it up on your phone. Do you know that there, right now in our country, there are organizations trying to ban all spiritual things from being on the internet? Will we have this before the Lord comes? Will we be able to use this? I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is my faith is on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ain't over yet, but hallelujah. Hallelujah. The victory is already ours. Will you say hallelujah in 2023? Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, so many ways in the Bible you give us similar sentiments, promises and evidence, miracles and history and prophecies and experiences that are there to build our faith. They're there for a reason. They're there to sustain us. They're there to encourage us. They're there to strengthen us, Lord. They're there to be that coat on us that changes us, to give us hope. And Lord, I'm thankful that the four hallelujahs are there, even though we're not there yet. 
in our mind and in our faith, in our confidence, in our hope, we are there. We are there. And Lord, that day may tarry a lot longer. In Your grace and Your mercy, Your plan will play out in this world, in this next upcoming year, and who knows how long. But Lord, we are ready now. We want to be ready now. We want to be able to cry out to You and join with those voices in heaven, to join with the voice coming from the throne, to join with the worship of the elders and the living creatures, to push back against the lies of the devil and say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord Almighty reigns. Amen.